the National Film and Video Foundation is an agency of the Department of Arts and Culture that was created with the sole purpose to ignite stories of the South African film industry. It's a story about nurturing uniquely South African narratives through the funding of the development, production, marketing and distribution of films, festival hosting, market and festivals attendance as well as the training and development of aspiring filmmakers. Our story is about igniting your stories and we will continue to do so for as long as South Africans have stories to tell. In the past financial year, our story moved in leaps and bounds as we pursued transformation and development across all spheres of the industry. Our training department's achievements include 127 bursaries awarded to deserving students. Through our partnership with MICT-CETA, 120 interns placed, three training companies funded, 60 filmmakers participated in the Sediba program, 12 film students participated in the mentorship program. Through our mentorship program, two filmmakers had an opportunity to work on a BET production in Toronto. 621 learners were reached through the school's program. The production and development of content is key to our business. In the previous financial year, 81 projects were funded in development, 48 in production, one slate funded for female filmmakers, youth filmmakers. The NFVF commissioned four special projects, one to commemorate Nelson Mandela's centenary, two towards the advancement of our culture and heritage, and one co-production incentive with the Canada Media Fund. Our efforts to create sustainable companies continues through the slate project that we fund, such as the three fiction slates, one animation and one documentary slate. For co-productions, eight projects were certified, four for advanced ruling and four for final ruling. We hosted two co-production forums in partnership with the Department of Trade and Industry and the South African Consulate in Canada. The marketing and distribution report for 2017-2018 financial year is noteworthy with the following achievements. 12 festival grants awarded to national festivals covering 8 of our 9 provinces. 13 festival activations. 99 filmmakers funded to attend local and international markets and film festivals. 3 public screenings and the We Are Africa Film Festival. 7 awareness and industry events hosted activated at eight international festivals for global positioning. Attended four strategic markets to promote proudly South African content. Four brand activations and four communications campaigns implemented per quarter. These resulted in an overall increase in applications. 10 marketing and distribution grants awarded. 16 stakeholder engagements hosted during the financial year. The NFVF launched its VOD platform, SAMB.net, and all South African filmmakers are encouraged to submit their content on the platform. The South African Film and Television Awards, SAFTA's, brand continues to grow, and this is evident in the 30% increase in viewership. Policy and Research Five research publications published, four quarterly monitoring reports produced, and two policy and legislative submissions with recommendations submitted. The 2017-2018 year saw much growth in our film industry. We will continue to play a leading role in addressing the needs of our stakeholders and the broader film community. Our focus towards the growth of youth and women in the industry has yielded positive results through partnerships with various provinces, strategic entities and community interventions. The National Film and Video Foundation remains committed to fueling the industry. We congratulate all the South Africans who have received both local and international accolades. We assure the industry that we will continually adhere to our duty of implementing strategic priorities with integrity, working towards improving the quality of life for every South African, while promoting equality, all through the power of the visual medium.
for joining us today. We hosted, we've been hosted by the National Film Video Foundation, and we're talking about marketing and distribution. We've got uh, you know, some of the best in the business who will be helping us understand what filmmakers need to think about as they create their films and what they need to Hello. think about even Thank you so before much for they joining us so today. We to be sure that they being hosted by the National Film Video Foundation. So and. Before we get going and start on the nitty business, who is marketing in this tradition? I just want to say welcome to our panel and also just allow what them to tell us a little bit about themselves and uh, what their part is in marketing and distribution and how they are part of the NFEF uh, funding panel. I'm going to start uh, with you, Mbundo. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you come into this conversation? Thank you, Ayanda, and welcome everybody. My name is Mfundo Nsibande. I'm a marketer, been in marketing for the past 16 years, 18 years. Uh, my experience ranges from broadcasting, uh, print, business, etc. So I've, I've cut my teeth in this game. Uh, I currently chair the panel of marketing and distribution for the NBF uh, for the past year. And uh, yeah, that's my, that's my introduction. Thank you so much for that, Vundo. Uh, Diane, do you just want to take us through who you are and what your role is? Hi, yes, um, I'm Diane Hay. I'm the Project Marketing Manager for Events and Strategic Planning at New Metro Cinemas. Um, I've also been in this industry from distribution to acquisition to content management, and now find myself in the very exciting world of uh, marketing. And yeah. That's my intro. Thank you so much, Diane. Uh, Mayenze, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you entered this conversation? You muted, Maye. Okay, um, thank you. Thank you for that, Asanda, and good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my name is Mayenze Kebaza. I am the head of distribution and financing at AAA Entertainment. Um, we are a distribution, we are a sales and distribution company, been in the business for almost eight years now as a distribution company, but before that, been producing um, and directing content. Uh, of course, yes, I am part of the NFF um, distribution panel. And yeah, my, my, that's it actually from my side. Thank you so much for that. And Helen, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and how you enter this conversation? Yes, my name is Helen Keen. I head up a boutique distributor called Indigenous Film Distribution and Development. We've recently um, entered the whole development arena as well to get projects from paper to screen. But we are particularly focused on local content. Our, our focus is this territory, not necessarily international, although it happens sometimes. Um, and we often work with AAA as far as the international distribution is concerned. So we do a cinema release, then onto pay-per-view, then onto television. Uh, DVD is kind of a non-starter these days. And TV obviously incorporates pay TV and free TV. For Africa in particular, uh, we've done just over, a, been around since 2009, we've done just over 110 films to date, particularly from South Africa and some from the continent. Thank you so much for that, Helen. Uh, we now go to Eugene. Eugene, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and, and how you enter this conversation? Thank you, Asanda, and uh, good afternoon to everybody joining us on Facebook Live and also on YouTube. My name is Eugene uh, K. Mametze. I am a marketing and communication specialist. Uh, I've been in this uh, communication space for close to over 10 years in marketing as well. I am a filmmaker also. I'm very passionate about stories. I'm very passionate about uh, culture and um, the preservation of South African culture, basically. Um, I'm also a co-founder of uh, Southern Class Communications. I work on strategic communication solutions uh, you know, across the board. And uh, in the last couple of years, I've worked with um, some of the filmmakers in crafting you know, strategies, communication strategies you know, for them. I've also you know, assisted them, obviously, in terms of you know, sponsorship. And um, you know, just to bring also to to the film, and yeah, that's me. 
Thank you so much for, for those intros, guys, and, and helping us to get a sense of who's in the room and uh, what the specific expertise of each person is. Um, we're going to start off now by asking the question of um, what is the importance of filmmakers identifying their target audience and identifying the kind of genre um, that they're going to go into before they do anything else? Um, we'll start that question off with... Uh, Eugene, if you can start us off, please. Uh, Eugene, you are on mute. Eugene, thanks, you are for the on questions. mute. Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you now. Uh, thanks for the question. You know, for, for me, for each and every filmmaker to, to start thinking about, um, you know, target audiences, you know, et cetera, you know, filmmakers need to look at themselves as business people. Um, you cannot, in today's age, you know, uh, talk about, uh, it's just only about the labor of love. It's really, really, th it's about, you know, the business. It's about, you know, engaging distributors. It's about, you know, understanding uh, strategy, your communication strategy. Um, it's about, you know, how do you understand your positioning as well? So, you know, with, with target audiences, you know, it's, you obviously have to look at your story and what is it exactly uh, what you want to communicate to people. So if um, I'm releasing a rom-com, you know, um, a romantic comedy, you know, for instance, I need to be able to understand exactly, am I, to am I, am I talking to, to females? And if I'm talking to females, what type of female am I talking to? Um, I cannot just be, uh, broader, you know, in a sense, I need to be specific in terms of, you know, how do I segment this 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 female audience? You know, I need to understand what they like, you know, what their interests are, you know, um, what their um, expectations and what are the behaviors also. So I need to actually get into the mind of a target audience, you know, before I even start developing, you know, the story. So so a lot of uh, the mistakes sometimes that uh, filmmakers make is that. Along the way, in the process, you know, one starts to think about, oh, who are my target audiences? And um, my colleagues will also attest to this, that sometimes they sit down with filmmakers and they discover that a lot of them, they've just produced or, you know, or developed the stories, you know, without necessarily understanding exactly who am I making uh, the film for. So for me, it's very imperative that, you know, you understand, you know, the demographic, you know, of the people that you want to talk to. And then also you understand also the, uh, the psychographics of that person without not understanding that then it's a problem you know, for you as, as, as a filmmaker. Thank you for that, uh, Eugene. Um, Mayan Zeket, do you have a, a perspective on that? And, and also, I think I wanna ask you as a, as a filmmaker yourself, doesn't that somehow take away from the creativity if you now have to think about who this film is for before you get to the actual story? Because um, you know, creative thinking doesn't doesn't start in a business sense. It starts with the story. It starts with an idea. So how do you do that in a way that allows you to still be within your creativity? Yeah, I mean the the tricky part. I I, I hardly call myself a filmmaker because I'm purely a businessman. You know, for me, I think yes, I come from a background where, as a creative, when I was directing documentaries, you know, I was making projects that or content that I knew needed to be told. You know, there's, there's always that section where from, from actually creatives where depending on the genre that you, you are creating or on the format that you're making, you know, purely I can say if, if you're making documentaries, it's always a difficult proposition because hardly there's any commercial viability when it comes to documentaries. What, when I mean that is once off, but if you're doing docu series and then it's all, I mean, the factual uh, space is much more vast. It's not limited to documentaries per se or feature length documentaries. But I mean, to echo what Eugene is saying, it's always difficult, like any other industry, to create a product you don't know where it's going to go to. Imagine if you just woke up one day that you're going to make these shoes. You don't know what size shoes you're going to be making, what color shoes are going to be, who's going to be buying this type of shoes. And who actually, so I think. I always look at even in the film industry in the same way that if I'm creating a, a property, there needs to be some sort of an audience or someone who's going to consume it. Of course, there's always the discussion around creativity is if I want to make, if I want to tell a story, I'm going to tell it regardless what other people say, then you must know you're not going to make money. 
you see, this is always the, the, the what called the, the juggle you have to make. If you are adamant in terms of telling your product, you must know the difficulties of you earning revenue are gonna be high because you're not basing it on a, on a market or on a specific audience. But again, I can't say that's always the rule. Sometimes people have something they feel strongly about and I might not agree as, a, as someone who's a sales agent or distributor, but then the product turns out great and it finds a market. But those chances are always rare. But the, the chances of success for those who first think of their audience or who first think of their market are always much higher than those who don't. So I think it's, it's, it's a juggle where you have to first realize what you're creating for, are you wanting to earn revenue from it or are you just wanting to make it because you wanna make it? So if you are making it because you wanna earn revenue, you have to first think of the audience because it's the audience is gonna either pay or consume whatever you create. So I think to, to what Eugene is saying, it's very important to actually think of who you're creating for. Even if you're creating for a grandmother at home, still an mm -hmm. audience, right? So they better they have to like it. So I think it's a, it's a juggle. It's all about, you always have to consider your audience. And, and that impacts in terms of how you finance the property and who comes on board to, you know, to help you make that property that you're creating. So if you are looking for financing somewhere, but you want to create a new other and you want to tell your story, it's always going to be difficult because you have to allow other people to input because to recoup someone's investment is all based on the target on all, so on the market. So I think it's, it's always, yeah, it's always a tricky part, but as a businessman, I always lean towards first find your audience and your market before you can create. Um, Helen, would you say you agree with this, working with filmmakers and, and finding those unique South African stories that uh, I'm sure sometimes surprise in terms of how they perform in the market. Is this, has this been your experience? And, and, and would you say it's, it's, it's a thing that filmmakers should take seriously and how? Yes, I, as a start off or, or as a starting point, I agree with everything that Manzeki and Eugene have said. Um, what I would add to that is that there is an audience for every single story and every single film. The tricky part is really to manage the expectations around the size of that audience and where you are likely to find that audience, because you may find a greater number of people wanting to engage, spend their time and money on watching a romantic comedy or an action, um, for, if I'm talking about feature films in particular, in a cinema environment um, and across the board in other platforms. But if you have a drama that maybe uh, culturally relevant, really well made, could win endless numbers of, of awards and, and be the kind of film that we may, as a country, put forward for the Oscar submission in a given year. The, the size of the audience for that kind of film may be smaller in a cinema space and bigger on ancillary platforms. And then a lot of this is also, I mean, filmmaking is starting to interject into television, especially on the high end, limited series, basis or even the longer running series that have more than one uh you know whatever ozark one two three four five uh, there's a great overlap that's happening between talent working in film and talent working in that kind of television environment and if you look at the at the documentary world um or the non-fiction world there you've got success stories that pipe up as manzeki said you know i think we all know the story of the tiger king who would have thought that anybody would watch a bunch of you know trashy Americans running around in cowboy hats, um, you know, fighting over big cats. But these things happen. So why I'm raising that example in a nonfiction or a fiction example is content isn't an accurate science. It's not a prediction that you, any of us could wake up in the morning and guarantee that if you make a certain kind of story for a certain kind of market, you're going to deliver most definitely 5 million views around the world. If there was such a science and such a formula, Somebody would have figured it out by now, and everybody that works in the film industry would have been, you know, racing around on yachts. That's not the case. The public is fickle. Even when you try and segment your audience, to that example, if you have a female bias property, which age group, which psychographic, which background, is it urban, is it peri-urban, is it, you know, the, the, how long is a piece of string? If, if you have a female biased film, it can appeal to so many segments and there's no such thing as one film that appeals to absolutely every female on the face of the planet. So 
it's a risky business. You try and negate all these risks in the planning based on comparators, based on the success stories of your peers. The best thing you can do for yourself is to watch as much content as you possibly can, because you may very well find that the ones, the films, the series, the docs you like best, depending on your own taste, may not be the ones that's hitting that popular thing when it's out on a screen. So the starting point is know the content that's around you. You know, filmmakers must, South African filmmakers often guilty of that. Watch each other's films, whether you love it or hate it, it doesn't matter. And then consider the numbers that those films delivered once they were out there. Then you start having some pieces that you can use to put your puzzles together and to try and build a matrix that will give you an idea of how likely you are to convince the audience that you are aiming to deliver your film to. And, you know, this is the burning point is creativity is such a complex and spectacular ability to have, but the harsh cold light of day reality that meets creativity in the middle when an audience interacts with it is you may do everything right and you may win a hundred awards and 10 people may watch your film. Um, so it's, yeah. it's like a long-term focus. You've got to, if you, I think any filmmaker will tell you, if you're in it, you're in it for life, it's like an addiction. You're never going to get rid of it. You can go to rehab. Every time you make a film, you're going to rehab for two years afterwards. And then you survive it, and then you go back. And you make <laughs> another film. So you can put all the pieces in place. The business part is there. But it just isn't a, a one plus one environment under all circumstances. You've got to, you know, develop that thick skin that will make you survive the swings and roundabouts of fickle audience responses. That's why we have surprised film shoot the lights out that nobody ever thought would. Sure. That's, those are some hard um, realities and they lead very nicely into my next question, which is uh, at which stage uh, after I've thought about my target market and I've thought about my genre, do I now approach uh, a sales agent is it after I've written the script and I'm ready to go? Or is it before I've written it and finalized my concept? And I think any any of you on the panel can can take that one. Yeah, maybe I could start. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, since I'm a sales agent, right? So I think <laughs> it's always, I mean, we there, it's, it's always a tricky part. We, we've always advised people that you want to come in early depending on the needs of your, of your project. Um, the earlier you can bring the property to us, the better it is for the for the project. But again, we are in a we are in a market which is South Africa, right? Which really doesn't have this sort of a practice. So you end up be, uh, becoming the only sales agent, and it's difficult to make your reference just from one sales agent, you know, and say, okay, cool, it makes sense to go to big because then I'll have almost every filmmaker coming to me, right? which I won't have the time to look at each and every project. It's gonna be difficult. Of course, sales agents are global players. You know, it's people who look whether the property can work, not only for the specific market you are creating for, that it could work for other markets outside your territory. Um, often the, pro the projects that come out specifically out of South Africa are always very, very local. Uh, of course, in the recent, months or year in this recent year we're starting to see new projects that tend to have a much global appeal but still to a limited um, degree and also it's always been difficult to benchmark how these projects do in the global space we can't uh, ignore the fact there's only one global platform that we're working with right at the moment where maybe we can take statistics from by looking at what they put on their platform which is only Netflix, because there's no other global platform just from here. You can't even see our South African project on Amazon, another global platform. Uh, none of the local players are global. So sales agents, as I said, because they are global players, it's always difficult, right? You know, to, um, to say to people, come to me with your property now. And, and, and I've said to people, come in early, and I, I get bombarded by synopsis and projects which, I know they're never gonna go anywhere. So, but again, there's still the, the, the right rule is, if you can find a sales agent early on into your projects, they might help you to start shaping it for a specific market. So the way sales agents work, we work like estate agents. 
So if you want a house, you go to the estate agent because they're going to get you the best house and they make the right fee. But also they know all houses. They know almost everyone what's happening. They can help you find the right bank, you know, to, you know, to, to bond your house. They always know exactly what's, what's, what's happening. So it's always advisable to come to us at an early stage. Um, I've, you know, in the, in, the, in the recent years we've worked with, I've, of course, I've seen projects at script phase. I've seen some projects which are already finished. The difficulty, again, where most people, when they come, whether to distribution or agent at a later stage, is they create this property. Even if it's good, you can't deliver because there's certain things you have to think of before you, know, you finish your project, whether in post-production, which we call deliverables. Let's say you want to sell your, your, your phone that you thought is amazing to the USA and everything's finished, but then you don't have E&O insurance. Or you want to sell it to some French-speaking market or some Portuguese market, but you don't have m and So all the deliverables that the sales agent or distributor will advise you upfront to think of, even if they're not going to be involved in your project, but they start making you to think about how you can prepare your project for a much wider audience. Um, so I will say it's, it's advisable to come in as early as possible, but I'm saying this thing, I'm not saying come to me because <laughs> there's many other sales agents you can find globally. But again, because in South Africa, we are limited to maybe one or few. I would say try as much as to go to a sales agent early in your, in your, in your, in your development as possible. Okay. Um, any other thoughts? Thank you for that, uh, Maya. You're going to be getting a lot of emails. I hope you have you have your email address ready. Um, any other thoughts uh, from anybody in the panel around the sales agent question? Or do you think it's been sufficiently answered? It has, but I'd like to add one thing to what Manteke is saying. Yeah. Is the reason why I think a sales agent or, or someone that lives in a a world where we're trying to, as distributors and sales agents, exhibitors, broadcasters, connect audiences to content, is um, if you take it to any of these entities early on, you're in a better position to gather information about market data than what you may be when you're researching it just by yourself on the internet or asking your friends. You know, sometimes the worst thing you can do is to show your friends your film once you've made it at your home and uh, you know five or six people watch it and they think oh it's fantastic but you know it's actually charming to them that you're a creative so it's very difficult to extract the truth about that screening from people that may know you personally so the reason to go to sales agents or distributors or whoever you can reach out to as a filmmaker early on in the process is to gather information and then that choice is still yours whether you're actually going to apply that information or not because Sometimes a particular filmmaker just has a, a gut out about a certain story. The odds seem to be stacked against the story, but they make it and it's a big success. Um, other times it goes according to the norm or the trend. Certain stories tend to work. Certain stories tend to find smaller markets. But it's very hard to, to make that case to yourself or to a funder if you didn't gather that information. Any funder is going to ask you for references or information packs, whatever they want to call it, from people that work in the delivering content to audience space all the time. So the earlier the better, and the key reason to gather information, and then it's up to you whether you use the information or not, whether you apply it or not, because all the power still ultimately sits with you as the creative. Yeah, thank you for that. I think I think that's a very important proviso that uh, you know this is advice and that you should or you should think about taking it, but that you can, you know, go with your creative gut. Because uh, I know I know a lot of stories of uh, filmmakers who have been told all kinds of interesting things, and their products have actually gone the opposite direction and been successful. And of course, there are those who were told to fix things that they didn't fix, and then those were the things that became their pitfalls. So. Thanks for that, that proviso. Now, my second question really is, we're living in this very interesting time of COVID-19. It's completely derailed some projects. It's completely delayed some projects. And at the same time, it's also been a boon for some projects who, for example, may never have gotten on Netflix, but now 
are suddenly there because Netflix needs all the content that it can get because it's not able to feed you know, the, the beast that is people who are on lockdown, sitting at home with nothing better to do in some instances than watch, uh, you know, some TV. Um, what do you think is the opportunity that COVID-19 presents us? And what do you think are the challenges that COVID-19 presents us in the film space? And how can people in the film space take advantage and or figure out, take advantage of the opportunities, but also figure out how to manage some of the challenges that it raises. And I wanna start with, with you, Diane, on, on that question. <laughs> yes, uh, you would start with the, the cinema person who's been closed yes. out for <laughs> um, Yes, the, the challenges definitely, I mean, are, are quite obvious. If you, if you own, uh, if you're involved in the cinema industry, it has been incredibly difficult time. Um, we can't open our doors as yet, we're hoping uh, this is going to change in the very, very near future. And um, I think for a feature film in particular that, you know, how cinema operates, we can also see that, you know, the content even from the US and from the UK and Europe has all just stopped and, and started to find alternate platforms that uh, they could potentially release on because it's very difficult if you have a release schedule and something like COVID hits, um, everything gets delayed and gets pushed back and gets pushed back. And it gets to a point eventually where the independent studios, the big studios have to make a business decision and decide, can we afford to hold back any longer or are we going to simply not release on, on a cinema platform and go straight uh, to other platforms? So for, for us in particular, um, COVID has definitely been more of a challenge and uh, um, an obstacle than anything else. Um, I think during this time, the most important thing for all of us is to try and stay engaged with our customers and, and tell them that, you know, we're not gone. We're, we're just simply sitting back a little bit. But the, the big thing I think is always to remember that what COVID is definitely doing is showing us the platforms clearly um, the, the value of each platform. And, and as filmmakers and creatives, we need to understand that in particular. Um, studios make films for cinema. They, that's why you have four story screens and 4K laser projection and all of that. You cannot uh, replace that on a home entertainment screen at all. So we've learned very valuable lessons during this time. And um, yeah, we just hope to open really, really soon, which we will. Thank you for that. Uh, another sobering thought. Um, I'm hoping, Vundo, you're going to give me some positive news, maybe around the opportunities that exist, because we like to think that it has to be, you know, some kind of silver lining somewhere. So please give me some good news. The, the upside, I think, is the, the increase in eyeballs you know, um, because of the alternative platforms. And the upside is that because people are more, mostly at home, so they get to consume a lot of entertainment to also distract from what is happening out there. Also, the opportunity, I think, for filmmakers is forget about the normal. This is the new normal in terms of distribution. Uh, new platforms are created. And also understanding the value chain is that the value chain has been disrupted to very effectively because of the alternative platforms. And which also means <clears throat> it's good for broadcasters. It's good for platform owners as well, because then we're gonna have a lot of content that we never used to see before because they were either waiting to first go to cinema and then only come to you know, a, a platform like television and, and linear television that is. So now the opportunity is you can skip certain channels and now go straight into the viewers, which is to your previous question as well. I think for us, especially as a panel, the discussion we've always had was the successes of certain films versus others is, 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 is similar in a sense of the silver lining is when do you start engaging broadcasters, uh, cinemas in terms of the product that you want to develop. A lot of people come at the end and you see a product that's been, a film that's gonna be launched next week and it's only being advertised a week before. So it doesn't even have enough traction to hold into the market. However, the upside of COVID is we, we now are forced from consumers and everybody else, we are forced to 
rethink, relook at how we consume and also the taste. You know, I, I now can consume what I feel at my own convenient times. I don't have to wait for something to be first available. So that, that is also changing in terms of the consumer behavior. What time do we consume and et cetera? Because before, because we're so busy with the nine to five that you only be watching cinema or entertainment largely on weekends. But now it's a Monday to Sunday type of a thing. So which means we need more content. We need more local content to be produced. And we need those content that never made it to cinema to now be available to, to other platforms and, and uh, broadcasters as well. Mm. Yeah. Thank you so much. I think that's a very interesting point you make there about, you know, this value chain disruption and how suddenly everybody needs content and suddenly maybe movies that had been written off could get a second lease on life. And, I, and I'd like you, Eugene, to come in there and just take us a little bit through your thoughts on, on this value chain disruption and what you're seeing that's happening and where the opportunities are for, uh, for, for filmmakers. Uh, thanks, Asanda. I mean, um, like I mean, Funa says, I mean, uh, there's a disruption obviously happening, you know, currently, and you know, filmmakers have to, you know, uh, step up to these opportunities. I mean, what we've seen also in uh, the last couple of months, I mean, we've seen uh, filmmakers also, um, you know, linking with online platforms to, you know, release, you know, their content. We've seen uh, big events also. You know, taking a very hybrid approach, you know, um, of television and uh, online platforms to communicate messages to to audiences. And the nice thing about it is that audiences are now more receptive because they are at home. So you've got a very captive audiences that is saying to you that I'm available. Um, you know, you can actually continue, you know, bringing uh, uh, content uh, over to me. So, so definitely um, also with uh, the digital space, I mean, the advent of digital uh, in the last couple of years has also evolved. So you'd find that there are now platforms, you know, for that filmmakers can actually utilize, you know, to drive, um, you know, their content, you know, to find an you know, audience that is actually waiting. So if I'm a filmmaker and I don't have a brand profile online, it's a problem already, you know, if, um, I'm a filmmaker, I'm only just creating just for the fun of it, then it's not actually helping you as a business person. So you also have to make sure that, you know, audiences that are there, they also know you as to who you are as well. So there's quite a lot of platforms. We're very excited that, you know, you uh, one can actually access content, you know, either I'm mobile, you know, or I'm at home, you know, or different platforms. But, you know, like Diane said also, Cin uh, uh, the feature film business is really, really about cinema. So cinema is still also a platform, you know, for people, you know, to to continue consuming this content. So we shouldn't actually uh, uh, discard that uh, and just look only at opportunities that are online and say this is where I'm zooming in. So and also because I've had through you know some conversation that you know people are now streaming streaming their content only specifically for online market, you know, so. We also have to think that there are also other platforms also that we can, you know, that we can actually take our content to. So um, it's it's quite exciting that you know there are platforms online also that you know one can actually um, zoom in into over and above you know the VOD uh, platforms. Yeah, thank you so much for for that, and I hope that the the people who have visions of being filmmakers or who have already started the journey are listening and, and taking notes on some of the opportunities that you're highlighting. Um, I, I want to come to you now, Helen. You probably had paid lots of money for lots of films that were going to come and were going to be delivered. And you're probably sitting with some that have been delayed or that may not be delivered because of COVID. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that and how you're able to manage or, 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 or deal with, with, with such a catastrophe in a lot of ways? I think, um, at least in the distribution space, it's very normal to be dealing with all the platforms, like we um, cased it right up front. You know, we'll be working with exhibitors when something goes out theatrically, with the broadcasters when we're selling to TV, the ASVOD and the TVOD platforms when it's going on to those platforms. So. As a distributor, your arena to deliver content to people, 
or our arena to deliver content to people has always been confined only by the number of platforms that exist. Um, the films, to go to that point of, of what Eugene is saying is, what COVID has done to an extent is it's changed the creative community's opinion of the credibility of an online platform. Um, because I think we all agree that cinema is obviously in an ideal world, the best place to, you can never really compare lights going down, you know, a, a communal experience where you're watching something on a huge screen with any other particular offering. So it's also the romantic offering, especially when you when you have a film that is not Helen, I think we, we're losing Helen there for a little bit. Um, I'll, I'll go to you, uh, Mayenteke, and just talk a little bit about what uh, Helen had started talking about. Um, what do you think? Yes, we, we lost you a little bit, Helen, and we're now going to be moving. Sorry to Mayenteke. We'll come back to you again. Mayenteke, no um, can you just tell us a little bit uh, about you know what, what you're seeing and what the impact of COVID-19 has been on some of, of your projects, uh, particularly, I think, from a cost perspective, because even if, if shooting goes ahead, the cost of shooting right now is, is much higher than it was before the lockdown, much higher than it was before we even knew of this pandemic. Can you take us through that and just explain how COVID-19 changes things, I think, particularly from a financial perspective? Yeah. Maybe, I mean, just, just to, to quickly chat about, just to add to what Helen said, you know, as a, um, as a sales in the distribution company, there's always been the good about COVID-19 and there's always been the disadvantage about COVID-19 in terms of the industry as a whole. You know, we work with multiple uh, platforms and then when one platform doesn't really, is not COVID safe, we move to the other one that's more COVID safe. And this brings opportunities. Um, I think the, what has changed actually globally, it has made the creative sector to understand that you, do, you don't depend on one platform, but at the same time, you have to try and restructure your production uh, processes. You know, I think more and more people who depend on shooting outside Will have become of course a disadvantage and the pandemic is not going to stop it's still going to go on for the next two years for all we know right you know if you look at what happened with the spanish flu we're probably going to go into the second phase of this pandemic no one knows so i think for the next two years the way we do business will change completely yes there are people who are shooting now and and have to put in extra cost just to keep within the COVID safety protocol but it's still very risky because that people will shoot this get infected and then they'll have to stop production for two weeks again just to cover that. So it's still very difficult. I think people are trying to take chances. But from the perspective of distribution, the opportunities that existed is that if you have a right property that works for other platforms, then you are winning because then you quickly go into the next platform. I think also it's changed the windowing around distribution. Normally, traditionally, we have cinema, from cinema to pay TV, to pay TV, to VOD, or, or free to air later. But now things are changing quickly. The free to air broadcasters maybe are willing to pay more now because they, can, they get what's called first run or more premium content. Uh, pay TV, maybe they also they could maybe pay more. But again, you must understand our economy has also shrunk. So even though it's an opportunity, we're not getting, we won't get bigger monies, regardless whether it's premium content or not. The, the other thing that we, I mean, we see in our business is that as much as there's lots of opportunities now to start flooding all these platforms that are looking for content, South Africans, aren't, we're not creating enough content anyway, you know? So there's no content available out there. And whatever content was available were either owned by the broadcasters. So 
the creative sector doesn't own any content. Even if you went back to the South African sector and said, give me what you have, none of the stuff they have, they own it. They probably will have licensed it to another platform already. No one owns any assets in terms of this industry. The, the firm, let's say in the feature firm sector, even the firms that now maybe are in need on the VOD space, let's say Netflix, one stuff, it's not available for the continent of Africa because it's either in the library to another, to another uh, pay TV channel or it's either the, the, it's too old or even it doesn't even work. I mean, because the content we're creating, again, this comes back to our first question. All platforms aren't just going to take whatever is available. I mean, audiences aren't stupid, right? They know when it's something old and they know when it's something that's not great. So even though there's stuff that's available, it doesn't necessarily mean it's just SABC is going to buy it because your content might just not be great or might not be what audiences want to see. You can flood it as much as you can, but people are just not going to watch it. Whether, same as Netflix, is not going to just take whatever you created. You know, they have to first service their premium audience that wants specific audience. It would be the same thing as multi-choice. So is this, COVID-19 has opened, but the disadvantage of COVID-19, and I can see throughout the industry, you know, lots of people are suffering because they're not going into production. The problem our creative sector is all based on production uh, revenue. You know, people want to create something, regardless whether it goes where or not, they couldn't really care, right? They just want to create because when you create, you make a producer fee, a director fee, or that fee. No one really think of what you could do afterwards. I think now it's shifting people's perspective that if actually I own the right assets, now I'll be making money. I mean, we as a, as a global sales company, right? I mean, Helen Kuhn can attest. We get calls almost every time. I, I, I'm doing a deal with North America now. They want to diverse content. Now, diversity has become a big norm, right? Because people realizing diversity, black or disabled people, more and more people need to start watching that content. But it doesn't exist. They come to Africa and say, can you give us content that I said, no one owns anything. Or even if they own it, it's not gonna work for your audience because it's not great. So I think that's where we need to start thinking about owning or financing things differently. Or also making content that works for everyone. And again, I'm not saying you have to make big budget films. Story is story, right? If you're making a beautiful story, it doesn't matter where you are in the world, it will resonate with the audience. If it's a love story, the love story that is great will work. But a love story that you make for your grandmother at home, it's not gonna work for someone else who doesn't have the same grandmother as yours. So all I'm saying is there's opportunities that exist, right? But the, the disadvantage is that as a creative sector, especially in South Africa, we have this sense of, um, also it's not pre but we've got this thing where we think what we have already, should be bought. But what we have already doesn't necessarily that it works for the current platform. So I think it's kind of shifting how people look at it. Yes, I do think, um, as I say, in terms of production, there are people now who are wanting to, you know, to start creating content. But they have see as well as those with um, uh, related costs, and which actually pushes up the budget a bit. But it's what we have to live with anyway. Unfortunately, you know, for the next two years, you have to think like that. Cinema might come back into action. You know, Diane can tell you about that. But it's still, no one knows what's going to happen in February or March, whether we're going to get a vaccine or not. So as a creator, we still have to really relook really at how we are, we are doing things going forward. I just want to add something to what you're saying, Wayne, mm -hmm. about quality. Because uh, I do fear that the... Uh, the wave of optimism around the streaming platforms or the what people seem to perceive to be the endless list of online platforms where they can place their content is being overrated. Um, the thing you raise about quality is very important. Just because people are staying at home more doesn't mean that a streaming platform will simply pick up or buy anything that's available simply because it exists. That's not the case. If, if we're talking about, you know, you know, whether you're talking about Iroko in Nigeria, whether you're talking about Netflix worldwide or for Africa, whether you're talking about DSTV box office or 
I mean, we can list the smaller and the bigger ones around the world. You deal with more of them than, than we do. But it's we're not in a place as much as there's more places to take content to where a, a content streaming platform will simply take something just because it exists. They still assess it. It still has to meet the benchmark of quality and, you know, be in focus and have the split tracks like you mentioned and have, you know, errors and emission uh, insurance. It has to have an HD master. It's got to have subtitles separate from the film. All of that stuff is a reality. And then beyond that, the story is the story. If it doesn't convince, convince if it's badly executed, just because it exists, doesn't mean someone's going to pay for it. You can put it for free on YouTube just because it exists, because then it doesn't cost anybody anything. But if you want to be earning revenue from licensing it, there's no way of getting around it. The, the fact that the content is going into the world now means that more than ever, you're competing with your content with every other indie guy in the whole of the world, not just with, you know, it's not a Cape Town versus Joburg production industry standoff anymore. It's now the guy that made a film in Iceland, someone that made one in Brazil, someone that made one in Switzerland or in the Dominican Republic or Jamaica. You're right up against each other. And if you can't stand next to those women and men that create content shoulder to shoulder, your piece of content won't make it onto the Jamaican online platform if it's not good enough. Um, you know, there's a big difference between paying for content and content just simply being able being available for free. Yeah, that's a very sobering part of the conversation, which I think takes us very nicely into the next part of, of the conversation where I want us to talk about, you know, you've, you've told us all these difficult things that need to happen. Um, what can people do in terms of thinking about potential funders and how do people even find, you know, potential funders beyond someone like the NFEF? Okay. Sorry, it, this is an open one. Anybody can okay. take this question. That's okay. okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I'll only I'll, let me start. I think it's always it see South Africa is a very sport, right? You know, we have unlike many other parts, let's say in the continent, where there is freely available money which is most of it you don't have to recoup. We have the NMVF, we have the Department of Trade and Industry, and we might have some small legal financing there from the Houghton Film Commission, KZN Film Commission. All these like really what's called grant funding is in numbers. Now, the, the issue is that people, um, even though that is available, right? They're not creating the properties to make themselves sustainable. Now, if, if we were to take any of those things are, there'd be no money available for the industry, right? Because commercially viable uh, industry, let's say like the North America is only purely based on distribution. Now, you, you, if you, as a South African, you were to compare yourself against any other markets, you know, Uzbekistan, you know, who knows where Uzbekistan is, right? Do you know how they create content? <laughs> no one really knows and no one really cares, right? whether there's Uzbekistan or not. What we care is, if I see a film on Netflix and someone were to tell me that it's from Uzbekistan, I'll be shocked, right? I'll just be watching whatever that content is. But my point is, if we're creating a commercially viable properties, when I say commercially viable, a property that anyone can put money on and see a return on investment on it, then we'll start shaping as an industry. I think we're not there yet right but with what is available in terms of free what's called grants or or government financing we need to use it to the to the utmost so that that it help us to create properties that can help us generate to make more and more and more properties so all, all it is at the moment if you don't go to the nfdf or you don't go to the kazakh film commission it's difficult for people to go to the bank you know we have a bank again that is very gracious, called the IDC in South Africa. But the IDC, they're a good bank because FNB won't give you the same, uh, they won't look at you the same way as IDC will look at in terms of this industry. Because as much as IDC is a bank, they still do not take your, they don't ask for your collateral. So they don't take your house, you know, when you go to them. You don't put your house as a, 
is, is guaranteed. Whereas if, if, okay, some of us don't have houses, but you don't have any collateral to be able to say, this is, um, this, is a, this, is a, this is a guarantee, where if you go into a normal bank, a commercial bank, you need to be able to have some assets to show. So I think the, the difficulty or the question again is, if there's no NFVF or if there's no DTI or if there's not the industry for me, in my opinion, will probably crumble completely. So while we have what is available, let's try and make whatever we can commercially viable to generate revenue for ourselves. And those are both businesses. You know, Eugene, go ahead. Hello. All right. Um, thanks, Maya Zeka. But also, you know, the other thing as well, we need to change perceptions, especially like, you know, with filmmakers, is that, um, you know, NFVF or your KZN is the only platform also where I'm, I'm able to actually access funding. You are creative. And I think also as creative people, you need to actually conscientize uh, people who consume your content. And these are marketers, these are corporates actually that are saying that we are ready, we are willing to actually assist and actually support and fund uh, films or stories. So filmmakers also have to find different ways of um, how do I engage and interact with the co corporate funder? Because there are the over and above, you know, the grants, you know, your NFVF of this world. Um, you also need to, you know, um, collaborate as well. You know, I mean, we're talking about the global audiences. So we need to collaborate also with other filmmakers, you know, other um, film agencies around the world. So we cannot, the NFVF can only fit as much. You know, we sit down with, with, with a particular budget um, uh, of marketing, for instance. And sometimes it's very, very difficult to actually make a decision in terms of, you know, do we give this much to this person or so. So um, there's so there's so little, you know, to support a plethora of stories in this country. So um, I suggest sometimes, you know, when I sit down with filmmakers that you need to actually invest in, in, in a strategist, you know, somebody can actually look into your film, you know, from, from the outside, not the creative, but from the business perspective, that if I'm, I had to go and approach a Coca-Cola, what, are the, what is the, the return on investment for them to actually invest in the stories? You know, I mean, overseas, you have a very large conglomerates who invest in arts and culture properties day in and day out. Why in this country are we not conscientizing the corporate, you know, people? You know, um, so, and slowly, if we start actually, you know, conscientizing them, slowly we'll, we are able to actually drive stories. We are able to actually change the, um, the narrative that, you know, um, cinema is only for a select type of people. You know, we are actually now broadening content because now we'll be able to have support, you know, the corporate uh, market and, and people about, uh, are really, really about brands, you know. So I think for me, my input is that it's, it's, it's key for somebody to actually invest in a, in a, in a business manager or, or let your producer actually drive the process, you know, that as much as you are actually going to NFVF for funding, but also look outside the box, you know, look at, uh, I mean, you, you have like the, um, the USA embassy. I mean, they also fund, you know, cultural uh, 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 platforms. You know, you have other people, so many people actually who can actually fund. So the thing is that we have to change that mind thinking. We have to definitely change it because otherwise we're going to have like so many young graduates coming from after from, you know, film institution and go in the same route of, let me start at KZN, let me start at whatever. These agencies are there definitely to, to support, you know, the, the film culture in this country, but they can take as much. Um, so that's, that's, that's my point that, you know, we need to also engage the corporate uh, government and also conscientize people also about the importance of story, the importance of restoration of our, our stories in this country. I just, when I wanted to add, or oh, say, and also Eugene is, I do find it interesting that through all the ages and centuries and centuries across all the continents around the whole world, arts and culture has been funded by a particular segment of society, whether it's royalty, whether it's governments, whether it's corporates, it's, there seems to be something wrong with the human condition all around the world that all kinds of arts cannot successfully get to a point where all kinds of arts are commercially successful. So that for me is like the casing the statement. Then the second thing is, if you're engaged in, in businesses that focus on, on arts and culture, you know, it's still a business that focuses on arts and culture. So 
like any other business, you need to have more than one project on the go. If you are a creative, you can make your business sustainable. If you do some advertising work, some brand work, as Eugene is saying, some television work for a particular broadcaster, a film, then it means that you're opening up the potential of funding opportunities to wider than just um, the government agencies. And we are particularly lucky in South Africa. That is absolutely the truth, that we have so many places to go to where funding can be raised that is non-recoupable or grant money um, to be able to tell these stories with. But I think in the world of culture and art, it's always going to be that way. There's always going to be places, certain kinds of funding that goes into projects because it's about art and culture. You know, it's not sport, <laughs> it's art and culture. Um, it will always need that. But if you can make your business sustainable as a creative, by applying your skills to a number of uh, disciplines in, in your field, then across your various projects, you will be able to run a business that is commercially viable. I mean, I have to use Burnt Onion as an example, right? Because it is seriously single, that's on Netflix right now. It's the first South African film that's gone worldwide straight to Netflix exclusively 190 countries I mean, catching feelings was the one that broke the barrier for all of us, yeah. but they did it a little bit differently. They did six weeks in cinema and then went to the Netflix equally did really well. Um, but if you look at a company like that, as an example, they have a slate of projects that they're working on. That is television advertising, feature film reality, you know, and you also, you can't do it alone. Do you think that you can start your own business, do it all by yourself? Day and night, you're going to do everything yourself. That's impossible. Don't, just leave it. Don't even try. So if you understand that you're going to have to collaborate with people that you trust and you're going to have to diversify, apply your skills to various disciplines in your field, you can be sustainable. You will be able to raise money. You can run a business. But you can't pin a business on one film or one short film or one TV program. That you know, that's more of an, a creative ego thing. So I think any producer that has survived in this industry for some time will tell you that you don't survive off the back of one film in every three years. It's impossible. Nowhere in the world can you do that. Yeah. I mean, to what you're saying, Helen, is that mm. we've become individualistic, right? Just as a society, I, I do know, I do believe that there are people who will have that one project but we have to create an industry where you have enough companies that have this slate of projects that is these individuals can fit into, right? And we have also have to create an industry that distribution is understood for what it is, right? At the moment, we still think Helen uh, Kuhn has got his, her own um, selection of people that she likes. Diane doesn't like me. Mayan Zeke has got issues with me, but this is not how the industry, you know, I mean, to what Helen, all, in, if you, even if you look at Hollywood, right, when Hollywood started, it was a grant-based system. You know, the American government put in money so that it gets them. But now it's become a massive distribution business that it's purely on what the market works. There are, of course, miss and hits in Hollywood. And oftentimes I see the South African industry always compare themselves to, to content that comes out of Hollywood. You can't do that. You can't compare. If you want to compare yourself to that market, then you have to be able to follow the steps that led to them creating that property. Even if you compare yourself against France or Germany, you know, NFF has got all these co-production treaties with all these eight countries. But if you go to those countries, they have a heavily funded grant system that have way more budget than South Africa for sure. So we have to try and find like a unique, like a system that works for our market. And at the same time, look at, at how the other markets are doing it in order to be able to make it better. But at the end of the day, like what Helen said is, if I'm a farmer and I farm pigs, and then when the swine flu, they all dead, then I'm not a farmer, right? So I gotta be able to do cabbage, spinach, potatoes, things that will be bringing money to me on a daily basis because people will always be eating chips. It doesn't matter which restaurant you go to, there's always gonna be potato chips, right? There's always gonna be broccoli, there's always gonna be carrot. So as a farmer, you need that as a stable meal to keep your, your lights going. You can't say, no, I'm doing beans or I'm doing this. And then when there's a swine flu or when there's a cow 
something disease, your business dies. So it's the same thing as in the, in the industry. So if you are making feature films, try as much, do wedding videos, film some funerals. Now, if you film funerals, this will be the best time for you. You'll be making a lot of money. So all, all I'm saying is you have to kind of think differently as a, as a creative so that you, you tackle the bread and butter issues. Unfortunately, we all have to have life on. We all have to eat. We all have bills, some bills to pay. So you can't be only specifically just making that one form. Yeah, I feel like you just crushed a whole lot of people's dreams there. Like I'm, I, I'm, I'm touched right now with my film visions that you've just crushed heavily. Thank you for that. Um, Diane, uh, can you come in and give us some hope, please? for funding and how we should be approaching potentially? Um, well, I, I think really, uh, you know, Helen, Mayanzeka, Eugene have all really uh, touched on it. Uh, we've repeated, um, we have a fantastic funding body through government initiatives, through banking type initiatives, through corporates. Um, we, there, there definitely is opportunity to find funding. Um, you've got to jump through quite a few hoops and you've got to go through quite a bit of red tape, but truthfully, I believe that is the way it should be. Um, I think if we look at how long we've had these, uh, these opportunities to access funding, I'm pretty heartbroken and disappointed that we're still battling to break through, especially on the local content, to break through and see some of those fantastic box office numbers that, that we should be seeing in light of all this funding and opportunity that we have. So immediately I go back to, it's all about the content. It's all about understanding your market. It's about watching each other's films. Helen alluded to that earlier. There is not enough, in my opinion, there are not enough filmmakers and creatives that are actually watching and looking and researching on the business of film. Understanding it, it's not about waking up one morning or spending three months Diane, I think I think we've just lost Diane. Are you back? Oh. Am I back? Yeah, we just lost you for a little bit. Sorry about that. Uh, were you still, yeah? So basically what I'm saying, you know, I don't want to repeat what everybody else is saying, but I want to stress the fact that if you look at the funding opportunities that we have, I'm expecting filmmakers to really start coming up with the content, start writing scripts. Let's not have a situation ever again where we're sitting and the cinema doors are closed and we're looking at other online platforms and we've got no content. Um, we should be quadrupling the amount of films we're making. The money is there, but the stories just aren't, the writing isn't there. And we, and we need to really focus on that a little bit harder. I think if COVID has done anything, it's taught us we need to be making more content. Yeah. yeah, thank you for that. Uh, very well, many sobering I, thoughts. Uh, I'm I, sure Mvundo, you're going to add to it as well. Yeah, I just want to bring a bit of hope into the situation, mm -hmm. <clears throat> which is, um, I think the, the opportunity here is that we need to monetize the industry from inception of ideas to storytelling to creative to producing. When I say monetize the industry, the industry needs to be commercially viable enough so that we can start attracting commercial sponsors and partners into the business of making films. I've seen a model from the UK when the NVF did a partnership with BFI last year, where you'd have filmmakers come into a room and sitting with venture capitalist firms and pitching, having a producer to pitch a film or a project or a documentary from inception and having a partner that forces you to think ROI, what is the return on investment? And what am I hoping to achieve with this film from a consumer point of view? And also remember, it's not only about telling the nice stories, films also shape society. So also having to understand where are we in society? What are we trying to drive? Even from a opportunity from a tourism point of view, how do I make a film and partner with the Western Cape tourism? Because this film will be shot in Cape Town and will show the attraction of Cape Town and the beauty of it. So all those ideas, and, and I think it's been tried many a times, but we've yet to find a perfect model in this country 
even abroad to say, how do we bring the, the corporates into this? How do we um, show them there's value? I mean, there's opportunities like product placement when you're making movies. You know, put that iPhone there and then approach iPhone, that Samsung phone, et cetera, which I've seen in a lot of our movies, we're starting to do that now. So we need to be very innovative and, and literally not only think about government funding because that also limits us because if a movie does not perform well, there's no repercussions. You don't have to pay anything, you know? However, if we start bringing corporate partners into the value chain in the beginning as well, and also monetizing the industry, understanding the commercial value of the industry, because it is a business at the end of the day. This is not, not nothing for free. So whoever buys the film, whoever goes to the cinema pays their money, whoever sits at home and pays subscription every month or a TV license, it's, it's a business. So somebody in the value chain is making money. But guess what? It's the people who own the value chain that are making the money. But the creatives who are creating the content are not seeing the, the, the money. And also, I think to, to, to summarize what everybody is saying is that content is still king. You can never get that wrong. If your content does not resonate with audiences, you can have the best film and your friends can like it. However, if it does not talk to the core audiences, forget it. So content is still king. Yeah. You know, I, just a quick one, Asan, I know you want to mm. close. I was going to say, we have a semi-commercial industry, right? Because, I mean, some of these films that Helen mentioned, they, they, they had partly funding from the bank. You know, the IDC is the bank that is looking at return investment and has been financing quite a lot of projects in South Africa. So our industry, to a certain degree, can do show that is commercially viable. So it all depends on the property that's being created. At the same time, I think, as creatives, if you're getting, I mean, especially for the black filmmakers, right? If you're getting 50% rebate from the DTI, that should be your equity to a certain degree. And again, I mean, I'm bringing this as a way because when people go and negotiate deals and with other partners, with broadcasters, they forget that they've got that as a way to be able to hold some equity, to be able to explore it even further. It's a discussion that needs to be had. But people take that as if it's not necessary to them. So all, all, all I'm saying is we do have a commercially viable industry to a certain degree because the companies that Helen Kuhn had mentioned, they are running commercially and they are tapping into the bank. And of course, just like Hollywood or just like there's not going to, not all of us are going to be running su su sustainable businesses. Unfortunately, that's just how it is, right? But those who are making it and doing it should be able to collaborate with the rest. So if you are someone who are starting in the industry or who are wanting to make your first film, I would say, don't go and try to make the first big feature film. Go make short films, hone your skill, make sure that you can create the right property just from starting with short films. So again, I think we, we must not underestimate the fact that we have banks, we have private equity, we have private money that already exists in South Africa as we speak. It's whether we are creating the right property for those, uh, for those investors. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that, because I was, I was actually going to come to you about Black filmmakers and the lack of money and the lack of funding and the lack of everything that people are currently facing at the moment. But I, I think I, I'm, I'm, we're going to come back. Uh, there's a couple of things that I still want us to unpack a little bit later. Uh, so maybe you could think about them a little bit at the back of your mind, um, but I want us to to start with the questions. But the key things that I want us to unpack a little bit is is this idea of using the grant funding and the other kind of funding that's available uh, as equity when you go into partnerships with big firms. How does that work? Um, how do people do that? It's this idea of uh, speaking to commercial partners and commercial entities and seeing how they can be your partners, how would that work and how would you suggest that goes? And I think also for me, it's also homework for the NFEF that maybe the NFEF needs to have another workshop and even beyond a workshop, maybe the NFEF needs to be creating this partnership so that people aren't trying to do this work themselves individually without necessarily the, 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 the big name support that the NFEF and other entities can provide. So I'd like us now to, to, to go to some of the questions, uh, but I want you guys to have those questions that I want us to come back to at a little bit later stage uh, at the back of your mind. So some of the questions that have been asked, and there's so many, I have to sort of try and go back to the beginning because we've been going on for like just over uh, 
an hour and 20 minutes. So what people want to know is, uh, I'll tell you as soon as I get to the questions. So one of the first questions we got was, um, in terms of genre, when can filmmakers tap into thrillers and horrors, uh, et cetera, and still be commercial? So I think we'll, 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 take, the, we'll take three questions and then I'll, I'll come back to hear your, to hear your, your, your responses to it. Um, and then another question that came through said, uh, sorry. What if you want to shoot a motion picture, then you go look for funding. The funding institutions want you to have a deal with a distributor before they fund you. So that's a question. I think the question is, oh, how do we bridge that gap? So if you go, if you want to shoot a motion picture, you look for funding, the funding institution wants you to have a deal with a distributor already before they fund you. Should you be bridging that gap? Should you just be going to a distributor or is there a way to do that? I think that's the question. Um, and then how do filmmakers say in the private sector get more exposure on the films they've made and on the films that may not necessarily be produced by government bodies? So I think this question will tap into what you had spoken about earlier, Manenteke, which is that uh, people don't own their content. So there's content and we should be tapping into it, but because people don't own it, we're not able to fully take advantage of this current moment of COVID and everybody looking for content and particularly looking for, for diverse content. So I don't know if you wanna take us uh, through those questions and then I'll say, uh, Maya, we'll, we'll, we'll come to you with that question, but let's start with, uh, with Mfundo and, and Eugene. Uh, taking us through some of those questions. You can pick any of the two that I've, I've just spoken to. If I remember the questions, just help me out there, Asanda, if I forget anything. Yeah. But to yeah. talk about the, the bridging the gap between a funding, a funder, and wanting you to have a, a deal with the platform, we've seen that, yes, we've seen that with, even with the applications. Um, that we seem to get as a panel is that yeah. when we look for the marketing plan, because the marketing and distribution plan is for us to give you funds to help you get the full to the eyeballs of the consumer, either be cinema or et cetera. All we, want, all we ever want to see is you having, understanding the value chain, which is the first thing, to understand that your film needs to go through certain processes, number one. Number two, the, you may not have a finalized deal but you might have a platform or a distributor that is already interested into your project that shows the, the viability of your project that somebody else in the value chain uh, believes in your project. So that is what we look for most of the time. And what we tend to see is that the, the description or the, the marketing plan around distribution tends to be very vague, where there's so much focus on, <laughs> for example, only for cinema, or at that time, you don't have even a, an agreement uh, with any of the cinema companies. However, somebody wants uh, money, but they don't show that they've gone through the process of engaging a distributor. They've gone through a process of understanding the value chain for their films. So I think for me, it's key that that happens. And we do encourage people as well that when they apply for funding, if there's a certain MOU they've signed, there's a certain agreement in writing to say there is a interest from a distributor or from a channel, a platform rather, that they attach that into the application. It makes the application strong because even from the NAVF side, we then see the value and we see also that this project has a hope to see the light of day. So I'll take that question and then I think Eugene will take the second one. Yes, Eugene, you can take the other question. I think your your next question was talking about genre, hey? correct? It, it's genre, yeah. Yes. It's, it's, it's genre. I think, you know, for me, I'm, I'm not a writer, but um, I think if I'm So it was about genre and particularly horror and, yes. and, and its potential for commercialization in South Africa. All right. Um, the thriller and I think um, horror uh, genres are very audience specific, you know, in this country. You have a particular audiences that have appetite, you know, for that. 
Um, and I know, I know uh, for a fact that um, we had a particular film actually uh, not so long ago. And, um, and I mean, they understood exactly who they were actually talking to. And you can actually tell from, 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 from the submission that uh, this person is um, familiar with the genre um, space. So you cannot actually write for genre and you don't really know much about, you know, I mean, the horror space. So one, you obviously have to have appetite. You know, number two, you also have to be skilled and watch also, you know, various directors and writers also into, into the, the, um, that, that, that specific space. Because then also it, it gives you, uh, you know, um, accolades, you know, for people who are obviously, you know, reviewing your submission that, you know, you understand exactly who you are actually talking to. And also when it comes to market, um, you also have to understand your position. I cannot have a horror um, genre and decide to advertise on SABC one. So your marketing uh, plan has to make sense also that, you know, I've studied, you know, uh, uh, these audiences, you know, you know, with um, horror, for instance, it is a particular audiences that you're talking to, you know, it's more of like a, a cult type of following that you have. So you also have to all, uh, look into um, the, those, uh, those platforms. Um, I also just want to add, add on in terms of uh, funding was that uh, Helen releases quite a lot of films and most of the films they become like quite a success, you know, at, at box office. So collaborative approach is needed there. You know, uh, those filmmakers, how, what, how do they get it right? So then to also have a conversation with um, up and coming filmmakers, you know, that they've managed to go a different route in terms of funding. You know, they've gone through a commercial route, for instance. What is it that is needed, you know, for them to be able to apply for that funding, for them to actually develop those stories? So the other thing is that it's, 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 a, it's a collaborative approach and, um, and unity as well, because you'd find that there's particular, I mean, you find that, I'm gonna be specific, you know, African's content, especially feature films in cinema, they work. Why do they work? You know, and you'd find that um, some um, Africans uh, filmmakers, they don't necessarily go the route of um, arts and culture, but they go through the route of um, your corporate, you know, your private, you know, your venture capitalists. Where do they go? You know, so they, so if I'm an up and coming filmmaker or an established filmmaker, I need to also collaborate with them. I need to actually understand their strategy. What is it that actually works for them? How did it work? And if, I'm, if I've got the right story, can I go to that particular funder, you know, for, 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 for capital? Um, so I think, you know, the conversation has to keep on, it has to happen all the time, you know, and, and I'm glad that we have Helen here because, I mean, she has access also to these people. So it has to be a much broader conversation, you know, with all, all the filmmakers. So that was like, just, I was just sitting on in terms of uh, funding. Yeah, I mean, um, probably not, but I think um, the, what I wanted to say, you know, in terms of genres, we know globally some of the biggest genres that work is thrillers, is horrors, is action, and sci-fi. So these are big global genres because genres have, they're like an addiction. You know, horror, horror audiences, they're addicted to, the, to horror. They just want to watch horror after horror after horror after horror. Unfortunately, in South Africa, we don't have much of an addiction when it comes to these genres. But again, they're very different, right? And I think we, if you look at cinema, at Jordan Peele's um, uh, film, you know, how they did, I think Diane and, and, um, and Helen can chip into that. But I didn't watch that film. It's not my favorite. But more and more, if you look at, I think Netflix bought a horror film called Eight, which went into the, into the global platform, which did very well. It was for Africa. And it, it really performed well uh, in terms of the local market. So, but these genres are still very difficult, you know, from the South African place because I just don't like, most South Africans don't like to be scared and most Africans really don't like to be scared. But more and more, you're starting to have a niche and start to have people who are actually in love with these genres. Firstly, for cinema, it was always difficult. But now on the, on the BOD platform, maybe people, when they watch it at home, they do get to enjoy it. So, I, I mean, I don't know whether 
when can South African filmmakers start making these? I think it's all depend on the on the creatives. But I can tell you globally, these are the genres that tend to work. I'm not the person for them because I don't really deal with horrors. You might have to start finding distribution companies or sales companies that specifically deal with these genres. Um, the question okay. about motion picture and fund institutions, why do you need distribution? You know, when you go to an investor and you want them to put money into you, they, they're always going to want to know how they're going to get their money back. And this, is, this has become a norm. I mean, we get flooded with people asking for letters of distribution to submit to NFVF or DTR to someone else. And the people that are come, they don't understand why they're asking it. You know, this is kind of the question that says, how do we bridge the gap? You don't bridge the gap. You have to go through the process. I mean, if you want money from someone, they have to have a guarantee that they can get their money back. Um, and I think, you know, your, your last question around exposure, say, how do filmmakers in the privacy get exposure in the films, right? I think it's, it, if you independently produce your film and without government funding, it's, it's okay. But then you still need to go find distribution regardless anyway, you know, for people to know where they can find your film. Distributors are the ones who work with platforms to get your film to. So it's regardless whether the film is funded by government or it's funded by private sector, there's no, um, what if there's no discrimination. Distributors don't discriminate. They don't care whether you fund it with, from your own pocket or you got money from government. Distribution is distribution. So rather find a distributor you know, or exhibitor. There's Helen, there's Diane, go to them. Just something else that you say that's very important, Diane, and then you can, I'm sure you want to say the same thing, is audiences also don't care about funding. They only care about what's on the screen. So whether you got the money from your dad or you found it in a treasure or you got it from government or a bank, it's all the same. You're taking two hours of their time or 20 minutes of their time or whatever, and their time next to their money is what's most important for them. So... If there's no way, if you want to make your film independently and you're going to get it to market yourself, that's absolutely fine. But then, then you can't take someone else's money and expect them to, to just believe everything you're telling them. Um, we are, it's like any industry. There is a value chain for a reason. None of us know everything. We all only know, it's very collaborative. We only know a little piece. But if we line all our little pieces up collectively, we can at least give input with regards to that little piece that the money that is around, the money that does get invested comes back that you can make the next one and the next one. So if these uh, structures, you know, no money comes with no conditions. If a funding body asks you for some kind of indication that your film will go to market, you should be able to give it. Otherwise you can't get the money. It's no one else is going to give you money to, you know, if you want to build a factory and make, uh, garden chairs, you, you're going to have to do a deal with Macro or someone to get the chairs sold or open your own shop. Otherwise, no one's going to give you money to make the chairs. It's exactly the same. It's no different to any other product, unfortunately, even though it may require more skill than the next product. But maybe it, even, it doesn't. Maybe we just caught in our own uh, bubble. Ugh, thank you, Helen. Um, and thank you, everyone. Diane, I, um, I'm sure you want to also contribute something to the conversation. I just, I'm going to be quick because everybody's touched on, on, on all of it. Um, the thing is, I also just want to remind you when it comes to genres, uh, especially in a, on a platform that is very strictly monitored as in a cinema platform uh, where we have to have FPB regulations and all of that sort of thing. Um, just by saying the word horror, you can imagine an age restriction. So if you also just, if you're thinking about making films and, and wanting to, the ideal film to make is something that is, it opens up your audience base. So if you look at the top performing films um, in cinema, it was Lion King, which had a PG. It was the likes of Black Panther. It's not talking to horrors and thrillers and high action with high age restriction. Just remember that as a, as a back, um, age restriction plays a very, very key role in being able to get it to access to lots of eyeballs, as Mfundi says.
Okay, thank you so much. I'm, I'm now I'm going to take you through the next round of questions. And uh, there's, there's a number of them um, which are focused on, on sales agents. So the biggest question is, since you said you're not even available, Mayenze, uh, okay, really, because you're, you're the only one and you don't want everybody sending your numbers, people are asking, where can they find out uh, who are the sales agents in South Africa? and uh, regionally and internationally. And then another question is, uh, how can they check for the numbers for the genre? And I think Diane, you might be able to, to answer this, I'm assuming. Um, and then there's also some questions around, so I'm just trying to remember some of the question. So yeah, it, they're looking for sales agents and then they also wanna understand, maybe if you just take us through, what are the different platforms? It's online, it's cinema, it's et cetera, et cetera. And then maybe do advantages and disadvantage of each. I think that might help people a, a little bit. So we'll take, we'll, we'll start with, with those. So sales agents, where can they be found? Locally, internationally, regionally. Um, and then the question around genre numbers, how do you know uh, where can we find out what genres sell in South Africa, what genres, what genres don't, and sort of what are the numbers? And then the other question is maybe take us somebody who can take us through the different platforms that are available and what are the advantages and disadvantages of each platform. And then I think we'll we'll take it uh, to the next round after that. Okay. Um, maybe Helen, do you wanna do you wanna start? Yeah? Yes, let's give Helen okay. a chance. <laughs> so I think the thing is just with numbers, um, it's very tough to find numbers for VOD, SVOD in particular, you're never going to find numbers for. It belongs to that entity, whether it's, you know, Showmax or Netflix or whatever. It is their company. They keep their numbers as, as their data. But you can find numbers for cinema performances and for pay-per-view downloads. And DVD sales in the old that, but you know, DVD is like really that's a, just forget about DVD, it's gone. Um, so the best place to look is the Internet Movie Database. Really, if you subscribe to that on the IMDb uh, Pro profile, you, there's endless amounts of information. If you're looking for information that, that you don't have to subscribe to, you can also look at Box Office Mojo and it breaks it up by country, the cinema performances and the films that released. But the thing is to try and find what you're looking for. You need to know the comparative films. So you're gonna to have to do some research, which is gonna take you back to internet movie dark space first. Um, and, and the thing about the horror thrill is absolutely true. In cinema, horror with or without nature restriction is a very tiny genre here in South Africa, but on the SVI platforms and on the pay-per-view platforms, horror in the world, if you make it according to the formula, because there's like 12 subcategories of horror, you will, you're most likely to succeed. Eight has done really well, like Mindzeki said. And there's one coming through from Dark Matter as well, that ink made that looks like it's gonna do really well based on the materials. Um, it's really the numbers I think that I could contribute to here, where to find it. Your sales agents is really more your thing, Mindzeki. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, can we before we go to you, Mike? Can we just give Diane a chance to talk about the different platforms? And you, I mean, you can focus on cinema particularly and what the advantages and disadvantages are, because that was one of the questions that was asked. And then I'll come to you, uh, Mike. Okay. Yeah. Um, with regards to to genres and that, and where to find uh, the numbers, especially for cinema, uh, Helen has alluded to already where where you can get that. Um, I also think it's a nice thing that we should be looking at as the NFEF panel to, to make that accessible, those um, sales agent contacts and distributor contacts and potentially, you know, even if we do it monthly, we will look at trying to put up some numbers um, on, the, on the website so that everybody can, can use that website as a central um, point. The um, questions with regards to um, cinema, um, and the various other platforms. Cinema is probably one of your most expensive platforms to release on. Um, it comes at a, a relatively high cost with regards to the, the deliverables. That is very important to bear in mind, but that's why you're looking at uh, studios and independent that are making 
films that have the quality uh, requirements for a cinema because a cinema is just that. It's large screen formats, it's motion, it's, um, you know, your average cinema size or screen size in a cinema can take, I think we worked it out, it's almost two and a half thousand of your 84 inch TVs in, in one screen. So, so you can imagine it's bigger, it's better. Um, so from, a, from that point of view, we've discussed already how the platforms have changed, how the windows have been squashed without cinema, content is getting out there, it's not stopping it. However, the, the cinema platform is also normally a platform that gives you a bit of a boost and an indicator from a sales point of view. Uh, obviously, the more, the higher your performances in cinema and your box office takings is often helps the negotiators, the distributors and the sales agents be able to negotiate better deals for your, for your content. Um, obviously when it, when it reaches phenomenal box office levels. So cinema is an important um, contributor, but it is definitely not the only one. And um, that is very important to remember. And again, from a genre point of view, you come to cinema and you're prepared to pay the uh, cinema ticket price. You're not coming, you're not sitting on, at home in your lounge. So the point of that is to make sure that you escape if you want to escape, if you want to escape into a love story, if you want a girl's night out, if you want to catch what's happening in the Marvel or the DC brands because it's so super action and sci-fi and all of that, that is why the cinema is there. It's an escapism. You get to disappear for an hour or two. And, and that is why we make films. That is why we have cinema and, and that is what it is. Yeah. <clears throat> So, okay, yes, um, my... so I think, I mean, just to add to what Diana, so um, I, I mean, the guys can help me. I don't know other sales agents, right, in South Africa, per se, you know, I do know maybe, I don't know if Brendan Carly is a sales agent, you know, you guys can help me out. I, it's difficult to know, I know lots of distributors, but I don't know many sales agents. If they do exist, just maybe they're out there. Um, but I do know that maybe myself, Brendan from Gravel Road, also do, does do sales. Um, and mostly sales agents are global players. So you don't become a sales agent for a territory. As a sales agent, you look at global rights and you exploit each right depending on the needs of the territory that you're selling to. Like as a sales agent, I can work with Helen Kuhn here as a local distributor. You know, or sometimes she does, she works as a global distributor. But I work closely with her because she understands the African market you know, for sure. And with Helen, maybe I may not do cinema, but Helen could might do cinema. So the sales agent, I seek to exploit your rights globally. And the rights are exploited on multiple platforms. Firstly, the first platform that people often go for is cinema, which is where red carpet, luxury, bourgeois, all the, the nice things are in cinema, right? Big screen. Then the next platform they go for is television. Now, television is segmented into three parts. You get paid TV, free to air, or probably those are the two. You know, you have paid TV and free to air, right? Which is another smartly bigger screen than, and, than what you get as your SVOD or VOD platform or OTT. Now, you, also, you, you have then OTT platforms, which are your VOD platforms. And by those OTT platforms could also mean box office, which is what uh, multi-choice offers, which is like a TVO platform. It's not necessarily like a, a SVOD, but it's a, it's a TVO platform, but it's within the OTT space. And then those are, and then you have airlines in flight, those are, because you can make a lot of money in, in flight. And then you have hotels, um, you, you might have bars, you might have restaurants. There's all these different, uh, platforms that you can exploit your property in. Again, depending again on the content, which platform it works for. That's what sales agents will look at. They might say, okay, for this feature form, it's not going to go to cinema, it's a straight to television or it's a straight to, to VOD. The disadvantages and the advantages of this platform, they vary based on your needs. So if the, the S4 platform wants exclusivity and they're going to pay more money, rather than you going to cinema or going to pay television. 
as a sales agent, I make the decision based on the needs of one of the content creator, as well as the remuneration that's going to come from or revenue that will come from that specific platform. At the same time, as a sales agent, you can window the different platforms and say, okay, cool. In flight can happen at the same time as SVOD. So it's all, I mean, there's all these different platforms, as, as I mentioned. But um, so that's our job as sales, as sales agents. We are global, global players. We don't specifically focus on one territory. And like I said, I'm not sure of how many are here in South Africa, but globally, there's lots of them. How do you access them? If you go, like as Helen Kuhn mentioned, if you go to IMDb, you search for sales agent, you'll find lots of them. And also you'll be able to find what forms they've represented and what genres they represented. It's just all it is, you just have to do a lot of internet searching. It's difficult now to say, I'm going to find them here. Uh, normally, you will go to markets where you have one-on-one -on -one conversations with sales agents because they often go there. You can go to their stands. You can go to their exhibition spaces. You can meet them. In this COVID-19, there is no physical markets. There are virtual markets that are popping up, but they are also difficult to work on. You know, we had Marshall Dufour, which was a virtual market. Very difficult. I think more and more, I think markets will get better. I know um, the, the one that's run by IFTA, which is AFM, is also going virtual. So it's a big market where you get lots of sales agents from all over. It's going to go virtual. So that's where you can find sales agents. Um, search online. And yeah, I think that's, that's basically the, the real deal. You know, it's difficult for a sales agent to exploit rights they do not have. Now, if you go to a sales agent already rights taken from you, it makes it difficult for them to do their job. Hence, it's always better, as I said, to go to them first, then you can, you can break down the rights depending on the territory. But when you go to them later, it makes it difficult. I don't know if that answers your question. Yeah, I think it, it answers uh, a number of the questions. I don't know if uh, Eugene um, Fundo, do you have anything you want to add to this round as well? Um, I, think, I think the colleagues have summarized it quite nicely, um, especially about the question about the platforms and the advantages and disadvantages and which platforms are there. I think the only thing that, <clears throat> even why today we're having this discussion is the, the distribution channels have been disrupted. That, that is a fact. And if we look at what happened to print, for example, as a platform, a media platform, uh, in the past few months and the titles that were closed forced a lot of print publications to go online. So which means new opportunities are, open, are opening in that front. We think the DVD market is completely, it's, it's dead, actually doesn't exist exist anymore. So once again, it opens up another market, which means <clears throat> where do we grow from here? Because also we can rely on the, the few online <clears throat> VODs that are available. So where do we grow our markets? Or do we create one as South Africans? Because I think that's an opportunity now to say, let's have a VOD platform where we can get all these films, documentaries being available. Because the main important thing before COVID happened, the challenges we've always had as a country, we made movies, but our movies did not perform well in the cinemas. And the excuse that we would have was that we don't have enough bums on seats. However, you see other genres that are doing well. So now that problem has been, in a way, been answered by saying, how do we create other platforms for filmmakers to have their product in there? The, I think that the opportunity also lies in um, I think uh, Eugene also mentioned about collaborations and, and also looking at what has worked and understanding the market, understand, reading the room, understanding the environment and the industry. So I think just to summarize there, that's, that's basically it in terms of the value chain and the, the advantages of each of them and opportunities that are opening up because it's not the end of the road. And even cinema is forcing itself to innovate, you know, even free to air TV is forcing itself to innovate. So everybody is innovating and creating more platforms and alternative platforms. However, the danger is that we must not be boggled into the old model of doing things. You know, now we need to be very flexible in terms of getting our products to the market. Yeah, that's what just I wanted to say, thank you. Just to add a quick one there, Asanda, without stopping you. Mm. Just to be specific, 
again, you know, in terms of the platforms that exist. So you have cinemas, which you have new metro cinemas, you have state cinemas, you have independent cinemas. Then you have television, which is pay TV, which is multi-choice or what's known DSTV with Mnet and, and DSTV has got BET in there. And you have free to air television. Uh, or oh, well, another pay TV is what's called Star Times. I think I forgot what it used to be called before. Uh, Star Set now. And then you have free to air, which is SABC and ETV. Those are free to air channels. Then you have all these OTT platforms, you know, these S4 platforms is Netflix, Showmax, VIU. It's called View, right? So these are the these are the ones I can name in terms of where from South African perspective you can access. If if there's anyone that I'm missing, you know, you can, but there's not many, and these are the ones that more will probably pay for content, rather. Uh, anyone that I don't mention is probably I've been dealt with, or there's probably no money to be made. You know, you might have local, what called, um, uh, it's called community television station, like Soweto, or any other station, maybe Mandela Bay television. I'm not sure in terms of whether they pay for content, but they can definitely showcase your, your property. Just so I thought I'd give you that specific details in terms of what platforms exist. Let me just add on as well. Um, I think we also recommend, I mean, filmmakers, if they do have you know, other platforms that work within their communities, you know, they should actually reach out to each other or, you know, to the NABF and actually just advise that they are, they are, these are opportunities that they, that they actually are utilizing. And I'm saying this because in Limpopo, you have uh, some particular filmmakers, you know, who have um, outdoor screenings, you know, or they, they actually still work, still utilize the, the, the DVD platform. You remember, I think my colleagues will actually remember so as much as we say that the DVD is dead, but um, there are also other platforms that filmmakers that that they, they know of. So they should actually just you know uh, collaborate and you know reach out to each other in terms of other platforms that do have potential you know for you know for, for revenue. Thanks, Asana. Okay. Um. I so I think that we we're almost towards the end of our panel. Um, so what I'd like you guys to, to focus on as we wrap up, so essentially give your summary, your conclusion, anything you've just thought of that you would like, uh, you know, the, the people at home to, to consider or to think about as they're putting together their films. Um, but also just explain a little bit because it came up in, in quite a number of the questions. Can you just explain a little bit about the marketing and distribution plan? What is it? What should be in it? How should people approach it? And, and how much weight you give it when you are looking at funding proposals and funding plans? And then anything, I think also that you are the people that uh, focus on, on, on these, uh, you are the people that basically deal with these applications? What are the biggest mistakes that you see and how can people avoid those? So we'll take it from, I'll, I'll, I'll call the people out by name and we'll go that way. So we'll start with you Mpundo and then we'll go around to you Diane and then I'll, I'll tell you who's speaking. Thanks Asanda. Um, what to look for when applying for marketing and distribution is first of all, we interrogate your plan, your marketing plan or your strategy of the how. How do you plan to get it from A to B? The second thing, we look at your marketing items. So within your marketing plan, we look, for example, have you considered PR? PR is a cost to hire a PR company or a person, for example, to make sure that pre-release of the movie, there's some PR that happens. What platforms do you want to advertise uh, the movie on? We spoke about how movies sometimes get advertised very late uh, and then which platforms are being used. Incorrect platforms are being used, for example. Um, show us also the, the launch, how you plan to launch the movie. Is it a cinema launch? Do you plan to have an event? And also the line items from a marketing point of view <clears throat> to a distribution. Have you considered <clears throat> the cost that comes with that? Um, so that's the basic that we look at. Obviously, we interrogate the plan. Where we've seen shortfalls, I think a big uh, tip going forward is 
people then put line items that have less to do with marketing and distribution. So for example, people are putting, um, paying for, uh, make an example, human resources, you know, salaries, bill, you know, included in that. We're not saying that we're not gonna pay salaries, but that should be on a certain, either a production budget or et cetera. So be careful of the line items and specify which line items that you, are, that you want us to fund you for. But the most important thing, your plan is to be simple enough for us to be able to understand it, to say we can understand where you want to go. We understand your strategy, your objective, and how you want to obviously market the movie. And then what we've also been impressed lately by is innovation. You know, show us how innovative, how you wanna do this project different from the next person. And, and how innovative are you in terms of the projects that you're applying for? So for example, somebody might decide to do a launch in the township and do it at a school, for example, and just have school kids being bused into a cinema to watch the movie, et cetera. So we look for innovation. And my colleagues will add into other things as well. <clears throat> so I'll leave it there for now. And then I don't know if you want me to close just to summarize because we don't have much time as well. Yeah, yeah, just that... a, a few words, yeah. Yeah, I think um, going forward, I think what we would like to see, like I, I, I can't stress this enough that it is not business as usual. Our new normal has changed. Uh, consumers, the, the COVID has hit us from the pockets to the way we behave and the way we do things. And the type of content that we'll still like to see, content is still king. We still need to produce quality content. We still need to get the content to the people, because I'm also not for exclusive platforms, but I'm for inclusive platforms that exposes and that gets down to the roots of all the provinces and the roots of all the people in the country in terms of opening the channels that gets, gets us that far. Uh, and lastly is innovate. You know, innovation in this age is everything in how we do things going forward. And that's it for me, thank you. Thank you so much. Hey, um, Diane, any thoughts? Uh, 30 seconds for, for the next people. Just again, with, with regard to the applications, and Punda has definitely highlighted, if you can, um, you you applying for marketing and distribution funding, by this time you should be, have your film complete. If we can see something of your film, be it a trailer, ideally the entire film, um, obviously on a safe link, that also helps uh, determine the application. The second thing I've written down here quickly, it is for first time filmmakers or, or content providers, having a distributor or sales agent on board is also really, really helpful. Uh, we work with everybody and it just helps us understand that, that you understand the business of your film. And finally, and the last thing I just wanna say, comparators, comparators, watch each other's films, look at the trends, look at what's happening, get as much information as possible. And welcome, we can't wait to see you in cinema very soon. Thank you very much, uh, Diane. I'm sure everybody's excited and can't wait to figure out how to do cinema under COVID conditions. Um, Eugene, you wanna tell us a little bit about what you're thinking or any anything that may have been missed by your colleagues around the applications, but also just any wrapping up thoughts. I think uh, what's key, you know, it's in particular to marketing is that, you know, I would, uh, you know, advise, you know, filmmakers to have, you know, marketing or PR specialists also, you know, when we submit, you know, your, your, your submission, you know, because they would actually understand in terms of, you know, either the conventional style, you know, of campaigning, you know, or the non-conventional style, um, because we look at this. So you cannot just say, I want to have TV, radio, et cetera. You obviously need to show, you know, innovation. I mean, Puna spoke about, you know, uh, product placement, you know, on television. What what type of content is there that you can actually link into to an existing show, for instance, you know, to drive awareness, to actually invite your know, audiences with radio as well. You can just invest into promotional radio sports, but then also find creative ways, you know, of making people talk about your film in the radio space. Same thing with print. Print, we've seen you know a lot of uh, print titles closing shop in this country. So now they've moved over to you know to digital platforms. What do you do within within those platforms? Also, 
Um, it's about um, you know promotional uh, partners. You know we, we get enticed if we've taken the initiative also of involving also some some of the, like you know, the leading FMCG brands also to to your to your story. So it shows also that you know you are creative and also you can actually leverage you know from from their brand. And the nice thing about it, I mean, you look at Disney titles. You know they have like very strong you know promotional partners normally when they have you know releases that are coming. Again, with with uh, uh, your 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 PR and publicity plan, make sure that you know uh, your film is built, you know, as a brand. You know, if you have like leading, you know, actors, you know, on on, on your campaign, utilize them. That you know, I'll be utilizing this person. I'll also dovetail mm -hmm. to their social uh, media platforms. You know, I will be collaborating I have with. To, sorry, Jean, I have to I have to cut you short. We actually have run out of time. I don't know if Helen or Mayenza, you just want to give literally last word as we step up. I just have, I just have one word for yes. everybody. Collaborate, collaborate, collaborate. Do not thank do you. the Lone Ranger thing. Thank you. Yeah. Mayenza, again? I think, yeah, I just want to thank the NFEF for putting this uh, session together. I think it's, we can never, under, we can't underestimate, it, underestimate the need for, for conversation. So I think okay. the more conversations we have, the better it is. So thank you Anna, for putting it together. Okay, thank you so much uh, to you guys for giving us your time and to allowing me to grow you and uh, put you in the hot seat for a little bit. Really appreciate that. And thank you, of course, to NFEF for bringing us all together. And I hope that everybody has uh, found some interesting ways that they're now going to do their films. I hope that dreams were not crushed but rather that dreams were actualized and were given wings and that you learned a little bit about the business and the industry of filmmaking and how you can make it work for yourself and how you can deliver better applications and how you can deliver applications that have a, a higher chance of being successful uh, you know in the market thank you so much I really appreciate everyone's time thank you The National Film and Video Foundation is an agency of the Department of Arts and Culture that was created with the sole purpose to ignite stories of the South African film industry. It's a story about nurturing uniquely South African narratives through the funding of the development, production, marketing and distribution of films, festival hosting, market and festivals attendance as well as the training and development of aspiring filmmakers. Our story is about igniting your stories and we will continue to do so for as long as South Africans have stories to tell. In the past financial year, our story moved in leaps and bounds as we pursued transformation and development across all spheres of the industry. Our training department's achievements include 127 bursaries awarded to deserving students. Through our partnership with MICT CETA, 120 interns placed. Three training companies funded, 60 filmmakers participated in the Sediba program, 12 film students participated in the mentorship program. Through our mentorship program, two filmmakers had an opportunity to work on a BET production in Toronto. 621 learners were reached through the school's program. The production and development of content is key to our business. In the previous financial year, 81 projects were funded in development, 48 in production, one slate funded for female filmmakers, youth filmmakers. 
the NFVF commissioned four special projects, one to commemorate Nelson Mandela's centenary, two towards the advancement of our culture and heritage, and one co-production incentive with the Canada Media Fund. Our efforts to create sustainable companies continues through the Slate project that we fund, such as the three fiction slates, one animation and one documentary slate. For co-productions, eight projects were certified, four for advanced ruling and four for final ruling. We hosted two co-production forums in partnership with the Department of Trade and Industry and the South African Consulate in Canada. The marketing and distribution report for 2017-2018 financial year is noteworthy with the following achievements. 12 festival grants awarded to national festivals covering 8 of our 9 provinces. 13 festival activations. 99 filmmakers funded to attend local and international markets and film festivals. 3 public screenings and the We Are Africa Film Festival. 7 awareness and industry events hosted activated at eight international festivals for global positioning. Attended four strategic markets to promote proudly South African content. Four brand activations and four communications campaigns implemented per quarter. These resulted in an overall increase in applications. 10 marketing and distribution grants awarded. 16 stakeholder engagements hosted during the financial year. The NFVF launched its VOD platform, SAMB.net, and all South African filmmakers are encouraged to submit their content on the platform. The South African Film and Television Awards, SAFTA's brand continues to grow, and this is evident in the 30% increase in viewership. Policy and research. Five research publications published, four quarterly monitoring reports produced, and two policy and legislative submissions with recommendations submitted. The 2017-2018 year saw much growth in our film industry. We will continue to play a leading role in addressing the needs of our stakeholders and the broader film community. Our focus towards the growth of youth and women in the industry has yielded positive results through partnerships with various provinces, strategic entities and community interventions. The National Film and Video Foundation remains committed to fueling the industry. We congratulate all the South Africans who have received both local and international accolades. We assure the industry that we will continually adhere to our duty of implementing strategic priorities with integrity, working towards improving the quality of life for every South African, while promoting equality, all through the power of the visual medium.